بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا وإمامنا وحبيبنا أبي القاسم محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وبشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I praise Allah Almighty and I send praise and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam His noble family, righteous companions and all those that follow them with right guidance until the day of judgment Ameen Glory be to you O Allah No knowledge have we accept that which you have taught us Indeed you are the all-knowing, the all-wise We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make this gathering sincere for His sake and to increase us in knowledge and implementation insha'Allah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, brothers and sisters. I welcome you to this workshop on the important question, is there light at the end of the tunnel? And I leave the answer to your good selves. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Yes or no? Always. Always. So we can go home. No need for the, the workshop, right? Or how do we get to that light, all right? How do you reach it? What if there isn't? The light's there, but sometimes we can't see it. Okay, very nice. The light's there, but sometimes you can't see it. Is there a situation where there isn't a light at the end of the tunnel? No. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Alhamdulillah, that's good to know. Definitely, but that's different. Allah is Nur al samawati wal ard He is the light of the heavens and the earth. Absolutely. And Allah is the ever-existent. That's correct. But the question is a light at the end of the tunnel, meaning in your specific predicament, in your specific crisis, in your life, right? Sometimes it may seem as if there isn't a light at the end of the tunnel. But that's something, inshallah, we will discuss further. Before I delve into the topic, please give me a quick uh, idea of your expectations from this workshop, brothers and sisters. I don't know if we need to pass the, the mic around or if you can make your voice heard. Five no expectations? Five techniques. Uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. To find that light or to okay. help others find the light. To find the light or to help others find that light. Okay, very nice. What else? The expectation of yes. The expectation of the Ummah at what they're going through in the current situation. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So the brother made it a little bit wider. So he's talking on the level of the Ummah. That's uh, a huge topic. Probably uh, maybe out of the realm of uh, this workshop, because the domain of this workshop is more uh, geared towards the individual. But to a certain extent, some of that you can extrapolate for the rest of the Ummah. But to talk about the, the, uh, the disease or the diseases and the maladies that the, the Ummah suffers from, that's, uh, that's a huge issue and uh, maybe slightly different. Okay, uh, sister, you had something? Increasing Iman, definitely. Okay. Okay, okay, excellent. excellent. So, Iman, the sister is talking about the importance of increasing Iman. Yes. Believing in the Qadr. Believing in the Qadr. Predestination. Yes. Okay. Which is one of the what? Pillars of Iman. Pillars of Iman. Pillars of Iman. Because okay. you see that whatever calamity comes to you is Excellent. Of Mashallah. How many pillars of Iman, brother? Six. Six. These are basics for you guys. This is easy stuff. Yes, what else? Expectations. How do we increase our yaqeen that there is a light at the end of the tunnel? Increasing our yaqeen that we will find the light at the end of the tunnel. Excellent. What else? To steadfast in this deen. Being steadfast in the deen. Excellent. Right. We know the way out or we don't? No. Many of us know to some extent. Some of us know to yes, a certain extent. But see that when it happens at a personal level, application is the issue. 
Right, right. Finding that in the context of your own predicament can be difficult at times, absolutely, yeah. Being able to apply our deen to our daily, you know, predicaments. Okay, okay, so applying the deen on a daily basis to uh, dilemmas we face and things what of that nature. Dilemmas, yeah. Okay, right, absolutely, yes. To understand what is the present situation, how much dark we are. Again, how much present situation are meaning, what do you mean? Where we are now. Where we are now, where we stand, you mean? Yeah. Uh huh. So, that we come to know so all of these expectations you have in this three-hour workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was four hours, and then uh, after realizing when Aisha will be, so it's going to be more like three hours, and then the activities that you're going to do, so that will be even less. But inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to yani, help us. Uh, uh, to benefit and to try to answer a lot of uh, these concerns. I, when I did this workshop before, I had slightly different responses about uh, expectations, but that's because the title was a little bit more vague. So then when the title was clear, I think things uh, became more clear. But this is pretty much what I want to talk to you about today. And ultimately, the, the, the motivation for doing this workshop in the first place was that um, a lot of the times, our talks, our lectures, our presentations are geared towards, let me say, good people like yourselves, mashallah, all of the sisters are in hijab, you're all, the light of Iman is shining from your faces. But what about people who are going through really difficult times? Who maybe are not attending the workshop? And that problem is... Uh, kind of a problem of marketing. Doing such a workshop in the masjid in the first place, uh, it would be wiser and better if we could do it somewhere outside. Because you are the practicing people. I don't think you have that many issues answering all of these questions. Inshallah, you will benefit from some of the techniques and so on. But I think you, for all practical purposes, know how to get yourself out. But what about others who don't have your level of Iman? Who don't have your same lo love for the deen? Who used to have your level of love for the deen but lost it somewhere along the way? It can be tragic and devastating, right? How do we reach those people? At one point in Kuwait, and this is one of the beautiful ideas I felt, but I don't think it, it, it continued for too long. I'm not sure why. At one point they said, forget uh, lectures in the masajid. We're not doing lectures in the masajid anymore. If they won't come to us, we'll go to them. So where did they start having their lectures? In the malls. Anybody witness that? Come on, no. I'm not that uh, old. This is just a few years ago. Remember that, yeah. brother? they would go to some of the mosques. And then the sheikh would sit somewhere on the bottom and start uh, talking about something Islamic. And then you see people you know, listening, you see people on the second and third floors standing and trying to hear the, the talk, subhanAllah. So basically they said, look, da'wah, the light of Islam should be like the rain. If you are not gonna be exposed we're going to come to you. So this is how they were doing it at one point. It was beautiful. And I thought it had a good... I don't know. They're even, they don't even remember it. I don't know. This was just, I think, less than 10 years ago. Nobody remembers? You guys don't go to malls, mashallah? They must have been strong. always in the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wasn't too long. But it was successful. Because I saw it several times. And... Uh, People were, you know, some of the, the, the famous speakers, du'at and so on. And uh, I think it had a, a positive effect. And then it stopped, it fizzled out for some reason, I'm not sure why. Yeah, so, but that's the basic idea. That we want to reach those people. We want to talk to those types of people. A lot of our talks are geared towards people who already agree with you. You're preaching to the choir, as they say. 
You're already talking to people, you probably all agree with practically everything I'm going to say. What about those who disagree? What about those who are not at your level of Iman? They need to hear these things, right? They need to be given this type of hope. You said, oh, of course there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. For them, that might not be the immediate response. Light at the end of the tunnel doesn't look like it. Not in my life. Not if you know my situation, you know. How many people have experienced this themselves or talked to someone, a relative or a friend, who went through something like this? Raise your hand and keep your hand raised, please. Oh, not very many. From the males, practically none. From the sisters, two or three. So yeah, brothers and sisters, good. I'm glad you... Uh, you reminded me without actually saying anything. The disclaimer is the following. Please don't be shy. Okay? Don't be ashamed. This is where we're going to air it all out. Okay? We're not going to uh, keep anything hidden. We want to talk about problems. Alright? We're not here to say, oh, everything is beautiful and the, the birds are chirping and the flowers are... No, this is dark. There's darkness and we want to find that light, right? So, you know, this is not a time, you know, oh, should I raise my hand or... No, 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 be very honest, be sincere and be interactive. That's the whole idea of the workshop. I'm not going to sit here and, and talk the whole time, okay? I need to hear from you. Right? I need uh, your participation as well. So, by the way, those types of people, those people who are going through crises and predicaments, are the ones who need such motivation most urgently, more than possibly you or me. They're the ones who need these types of things. But a lot of what we have in the world of da'wah is not geared towards that. It's talking to people whose lives are for all practical purposes going okay, not too bad. Things are, you know, going well. But what about those people who feel like they're in a hole? Or maybe it's one of you. But you went through some serious disaster or calamity and all of a sudden you feel like you're in a hole and you, you just can't get out right you need someone to help you you're doing everything you can you're trying to climb but it's just impossible it's too deep you have no strength you don't know what happened to your iman these are common problems are they not brothers and sisters According to the aqidah of al-sunnah wal jamaah iman increases and decreases. The issue of iman caused a lot of problems theologically in history. Because of the idea that no, it's black or white. It's, it's digital, it's a zero or a one, <laughs> right? Either you're a Muslim or you're a kafir. How can iman increase and decrease? Either you're Muslim or not. Either you're a believer or you're a disbeliever. Because of this idea, there was a lot of misguidance okay, in the history. And it engendered two of the uh, most misguided sects of Islam. And they are? Qadariya, close. Specifically, when we're talking to you, you're mentioning all of the different 73 sects now. No, specifically with regards to the issue of Iman. Which one? You're getting there. We'll get it eventually, maybe. Iman. Think about Iman. Huh? There's a sect that said, there's no such thing. Uh, the slightest sin you commit. Thank you. If you 
commit a major sin, you're a disbeliever. This is kufr. And of course, Ibn Abbas and other companions, they debated with those types to convince them otherwise. So these people went to the extreme whereby they were thinking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment is so severe you commit a major sin, you are a kafir. So there is no hope for you if you committed such a sin. Now think of the opposite. What's the opposite idea? And then I'll tell you the name if you didn't get it yet. What is the opposite of the idea? That whatever you do, it's no good. Your iman is nullified. Whatever. Close. The, the, the liberal ideology kind of uh, takes and derives from such an ideology. What's the, the, the opposite idea? The idea is whatever sins okay. you commit. You do. No problem. You do, that, that You're going to Jannah. Forget it. Yeah. So they went to the other side. لا يضر مع الإيمان ذن Ah, sin as much as you want. You're a believer. You're a mu'min. They are called al murjia The opposite of the khawarij. And this is a common problem when we go to either of the two extremes. So the khawarij are only thinking about the wrath and punishment of Allah. And the Murji'ah are saying, Allah is most merciful and forgiving and He will forgive all sins. And they forgot about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And the Qur'an says, telling the Prophet sallallahu Tell my slave servants, Anni ana al rahim That I am indeed the forgiving and the merciful. Wa anna adabi huwa al adab al And that my punishment is most severe. This is the balance that Islam gives us. This is the balance we require. Not too much dependence on fear of Allah and not too much dependence on hope for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We always have to be in the middle. How do we gauge it? Introspection. We have to look into ourselves. See where we are. Am I in a situation where I'm basically saying, yes, I've done this sin and that, but Allah is most forgiving, most merciful, and I forgot about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I need to move more towards the right, if we can use those terms, you know, being the, on the right, uh, in the center, on the left. Or maybe you're on the other side, and you, you're always feeling that Allah will never forgive me. And it's creating a feeling of despair for you. That means you're going towards the ideology of the khawarij now. You're only thinking about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you need a what? You need a dose of hope. Right? Sometimes you will be your best doctor. It will be very difficult for someone else to assess that situation for you. So self-evaluation is very important. Looking into our own uh, situations. Just as Iman increases and decreases, and this is normal. This is normal. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu mentioned this in authentic hadith. This is a normal thing to occur. When our Iman increases, we make the best use of that increased Iman. Beware of the shaitan telling you no, 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 you need to stay consistent. No, my dear, if your iman is, is going up, do more. Because this is not going to continue forever. Do as much as you can. But then if your iman decreases, what are you going to do then? It's going to go up and down. It's normal. Yes, some people are fairly consistent. May Allah bless them and, and give them more of his bounty. But a lot of us are like this. Right? Up and down, up and down. Kind of like a sine wave. Or a cosine. It doesn't matter. But it's always fluctuating. Similarly, nobody lives their whole life in prosperity or adversity. Alone. It shuttles. Life shuttles you between 
prosperity and adversity. And sometimes you're living both at the same time. There are aspects of your life that you can categorize as prosperity and others that you would categorize as adversity, right? So this is most normal. And we need to uh, learn how to deal with those different situations. First of all, let's talk about some of the important steps and techniques that we can benefit from. One of the most important things that we can do in such situations is of course dua. And dua, uh, when, when I'm saying dua and I'm starting with it, it's because you're basically uh, returning everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm gonna do my part, and there are a lot of things we're gonna talk about where these are things you and I need to do, but before all of that, sometimes we forget about the simplest, possibly the simplest and most direct solution, and this is dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it may very well be that I will take all of these steps, but I will not succeed in improving my condition. It may be one truly sincere dua from a pious Muslim, maybe making dua with something special that you have done in your life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifts that predicament something special you did in your life something you know almost for certain that it was sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because nobody else knows about it but you You can make dua with that special thing. And you can say, Oh Allah, you are the only one who knows this deed that I performed. If I did it sincerely for your sake, then lift this predicament or solve and get me out of this crisis that I'm suffering from. Right? It may be that one dua. Not all of the techniques that we will try. But ultimately the Muslim always combines between dua and between uh, other methods in order to solve their problem, in order to try to increase their iman, to increase their level of patience and so on and so forth. Of the duas, the famous duas that the Prophet ﷺ used to say, can you give me some examples? What Dua do you say when you're suffering or in a time of distress? Okay, beautiful. One of the famous duas and one that is focusing on the dunya and the akhirah. So in other words, atina bin dunya hasana. I'm not only asking for things in an akhirah but also in a dunya. Absolutely. And uh, Try to say these general du'as as much as you can. Wallahi, it is worth all of the other du'as that we try to make, where we make it so specific. The du'as of the, the, the Prophet ﷺ are very general. And covers <laughs> everything that you are asking for in detail and a million times more. When you say something like, Allahumma ni as'aluka min al khayri kulli. Khalas, it's finished. You asked for everything that is good. Ma alimtu minhu wa ma lam a'lam. That which I know of and that which I do not know of. And I seek refuge from all evil. That, I, that of which I have knowledge and that of which I have no knowledge. You left nothing, khalas. You covered all bases with this dua. You don't need to say any other dua. But unfortunately, these types of duas we Abandon a lot of the times and we neglect. Yes, I think a sister had an answer here. Another dua during a time of distress, specifically for distress. Which one? Excellent, mashallah. La ilaha illa anta subhanak 
inni kuntu min al-zalimin. Who used to say this? Yunus. MashaAllah, Yunus alayhi salam. You guys got all bases covered. When did he say it? The belly of the whale. You're going forward now in the, in the, the talk. Uh, why is he saying it? What's that? Why is he saying, Inni kuntu min al I was indeed of the wrongdoers. He's a prophet. Does he commit sin? Does a prophet commit sin? He gave up on committed a mistake. He gave up on his people. Barakallah No, he made a mistake. He made a mistake. So prophets make mistakes. Yes. You guys remember some of my talks. We used to talk about this, no? Uh, some people are still confused about this issue. The issue of prophets, peace be upon them all, making mistakes or not, committing sins or not. Right? Allah corrects their mistakes. Allah corrects them, absolutely. And they seek forgiveness for those mistakes. So here is Yunus alayhi salam saying, La ilaha illa anta subhanak, inni kuntu min al -dhalim. I'll get to that inshallah. What else? Give me another dua. Yes, brother. Ya hayu ya qayyum bi rahmatika astarid. Excellent, Ya hayu ya qayyum bi rahmatika astarid. Aslih li shani kullahu. Aslih li shani kullahu. Wala takun ila nafsi tarfat ayin. Beautiful dua. Okay, one of those general duas. Again, another neglected dua to, to a large extent. May I ask you to say those dua in English because we have two yeah, I will. Uh, some of them may not be that easy to translate. And either way, inshallah, we'll try to give it to you in Arabic so you can learn it and you can uh, say it in Arabic. But the general meaning of the dua, you are calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the ever existent, who is the absolute, who needs no, no one. Ya hayu ya qayyum. Bi rahmatika astaghid. I am seeking your mercy. Okay? And then it says, Aslih li sha'ni kullahu. Rectify all of my affairs. Again, you left nothing. Rectify all of my affairs. Okay? And do not make me dependent upon myself in any way. In other words, make my reliance completely upon you so that uh, I rely upon, uh, upon no one but you. But this is again another excellent dua. I want something with regards to a predicament. Yes, brother. La ilaha illallah is very close. Yunus said it when he was in, in a true crisis. Yes. Okay, this is close to that one. What else? Uh, let me just try the ones who didn't. Yes, brother. Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. Excellent. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, suffices uh, for me. Yes, brother. Okay, oh Allah, give us patience. Yes. Something about Musibat and Hada and Birra and Takwa, but I don't have it written to memorize. Ah, okay. Uh, no, or, yeah. Uh, okay, that's yeah. close. I, I have three specifically, and until now, no one mentioned any. <laughs> So that's good, inshallah we'll benefit. Uh, the sisters have their hand up. Yeah, sisters. Inna lillah wa inna lillah wa inna lillah Excellent. Even I didn't have that down, I'll add it. Inna lillah, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. We belong to Allah and to Him we will return. This is mentioned in the context of? In the context of? Death. Death. Is it? Not only. Ah, not only death. Our modern usage of it is only in the context of death. So once you say, in Allah, Oh, who died? Nobody <laughs> died, brother. It's a calamity. So we say, Inna lillah wa inna Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Noble Quran, He mentioned, وَلَا نَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ أَلَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَبَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٍ those whom calamity strikes, then they say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Death is one of those calamities. Otherwise, can be used in any musibah. Excellent. You had another one, sister? Thank you. Barakallah feeki. This is direct. Allah ma'jurni fi musibati wa akhlif li khayran minha. 
How many know this dua? Raise your hand. Subhanallah. Much less than I thought. Great. So now you have a new addition to your portfolio. Allahumma ajurni fi musibati. Oh Allah, grant me reward in this calamity of mine. And grant me or replace it with something better. Subhanallah, if you look at the Quran in several locations, it's, it's audacious, actually. People who are asking for rectification of their affair and replacement with something better are usually people who sinned. Subhanallah. You would expect the opposite. The people who are pious, who have filled their life with obedience, and then they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something better. But in the Quran, there are several examples. I won't tell you where. We'll leave it maybe as a bonus question. Where the sinners are not only asking for forgiveness, but for something to replace their situation and to improve it and make it better than it was before. Even though their calamity was... Uh, because of their sins. Yes, brother? Which one? The one where they thought to go early. Excellent, mashallah. Give them a prize. Brothers, do you have prizes? We didn't agree on a prize. Give them something. Excellent, brother. Barakallah fi. The people of the garden, right? When they went out and they were boasting and they were arrogant and they thought that this garden will remain forever and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed it in a night and then they sought the forgiveness of Allah and they said, Oh Allah, give us something better than what we had. It's audacious. Only Allah can respond to a request like this and give someone what they're asking for after something like this. What's the context of this dua, sister, since you mentioned it to us? The story, you know the story? Yes. How many know the story of this dua? Raise your hand. SubhanAllah, sisters are ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, brother, you know the story. Very good. But since most do not, or maybe you forgot, you know but you forgot. It was a long time ago. So maybe I should mention, or the sister can tell us. Yes. Umir Salma asked her this dua when Abu Salma died and when she got married. Excellent. So basically, Um Salama, radiallahu anha, when her husband Abu Salama died, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told her, "Say this du'a: Allahumma jurni fi musibati wa akhli fi khayran minha." Immediately, I mean, they were Arabs; they understood what is meant immediately. So she said, "Who is better than my husband Abu Salama, O oh, Messenger of Allah?" In other words. How is Allah going to grant me something better than my husband Abu Salama, right? I know all your wives are probably saying the same. When you die, they will say, oh, how can I have somebody better than my pre previous husband? So she said, how, how would it happen? And then eventually the Prophet ﷺ marries her. Allahu Akbar. So Allah answered her dua and granted her someone many times better than Abu Salama. Right? Allahumma ajurni fi musibati wa akhlif li khayran minha. What else? Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wa al-hazan. Right? The famous dua, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from grief and from sadness. Min al-hammi wa al-hazan. Wa min al-adzi wa al-kasal. And from incapacity and laziness. Wa min al-jubni wa al-bukhl. And from cowardice and greed, women الرجال, and from the, the overpowering nature of debt, and from the oppression of men. Not your husband, men. Like you know, the oppression of a tyrant or uh, uh, or any type of oppressor or someone who wronged you in one way or another. So this is another one of those du'as. Of course, during times of calamity, where iman increases and decreases, 
What dua should I say? What's that? Ya Ah, barakallah fiqh. Ya muqallib al-qulub, sabbit qalli ala deenik. Oh, you who overturns the heart, keep my heart steady and firm in this deen. Brothers and sisters, in these situations, calamities, predicaments, crises, people many times fall into despair and they feel that there is no light at the end of the tunnel. That could be because of a, a personal crisis, crisis in health, financial crisis, and maybe a crisis in deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Excuse me. <coughs> Some people may get to the level of despair not only in the context of a crisis that seems to have no solution, but even because they feel that they can never truly repent sincerely and come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe they feel that they are destined to a life of sins. Well, and distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So maybe they get to that level where they look at the likes of you and they say, I wish I could be like them. I wish I could walk into a masjid and feel the, the joy, the peace, the tranquility that they feel. This Jannah that you have in your hearts this paradise that you are carrying around in your heart, which maybe we have taken for granted. Other people would pay fortunes for, but they simply don't have it. Because it's not just something that you can, it's not something you can transplant. I don't think if you were to give them your heart that the Iman would be transplanted with it. This is something else. This is your ruh. This is your spirit. This is spirituality. They long for that. Maybe they wish they can have it. And as much as you try to give them hope, you feel they're full of despair. The shaitan has really done an excellent job on those types. In that calamity that you're suffering from, naturally, the calamity of the dunya eventually becomes a calamity, possibly, God forbid, in the deen. Iman starts to decrease. Many people, subhanAllah, they have qualms with the deen because of their dunya. They start blaming the deen for their problems in dunya. The example being, People who feel that the deen in some way restricts them, doesn't allow them to live their lives to the fullest like they'd like to live it. They want to do everything there is to do in life. But the deen somehow doesn't allow them to do so. The deen has too many limitations. Hudud. This is one extreme. Then you have the other extreme. People who complain about the dunya or rather complain about the deen because of their dunya. Those are the types of people whose lives, may Allah Azza wa Jal keep us firm, who lived difficult lives, truly went through debilitating circumstances. Things that would devastate even the strongest in Iman. Subhanallah, it's as if misfortune is their lot in life, right? And then they start putting that on what? On the deen. It's because of the deen. Or I have been a Muslim for 30, 40 years. Look at my life. So they say, forget about Islam altogether. God forbid. Naturally, 
such calamities in the dunya may affect the deen and vice versa so in these situations whenever you or a loved one or a friend or a relative seems to be surrounded by despair this is where you need to give them a very big dose of hope how how do you do that that's not a rhetorical question how would you do that you remind them that there's a light at the end of the tunnel they tell you no I've been hearing this for the last 20 years what lies at the end of the time? Show, it the Show the light? They don't see it as light. They, they tell you, 30 years, <laughs> I'm a Muslim and I'm, you know, I'm not that practicing, but I'm fairly practicing. Look what it gave me. Look, look at my life. Make dua. Make dua for them. Definitely. But now you're trying to give them hope. Your own experience, okay. I experienced something similar. You're not alone. All right. What else? Yes, just a minute. Actually, when I was back during the summer, I had a conversation with an ex-Muslim. Excellent. So they were Muslim and then they apostatized. Okay. And he told me because of the young man who died. And I thought that he was Muslim actually, but okay, maybe not Mexican. What have you benefited from? What did you benefit from? Mm. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, from, from that perspective, and uh, I appreciate the sister telling us a story. We need more of these, and I'm sure all of you have had uh, maybe similar experiences. When you're telling him, the, coming from the angle that you have nothing and I have something or everything, absolutely. This is in terms of convincing, trying to show them that you basically replaced, you know, the best thing that you had with absolutely nothing. 100% agree. But at the same time, especially when you're arguing with an atheist, you need to show them that what you're following also is a religion of its own. In other words, you claim to have no religion, but actually you do. You have a conviction and it's called no God. The, the, the lack of existence of God, right? And that's of course totally uh, you know, that's lunacy okay so then they start telling you but this is going to take us on a tangent um, uh, prove to me that there's God <clears throat> beware of that pitfall tell them no wait the rule is the obvious thesis or hypothesis is that there is a God you prove to me that there is no God the burden of proof is on him, not on you. Actually, right? I'm sorry. Yeah. I think uh, he had a lot of frustration. He wanted to come up on me. Not in that aspect, actually. Because he was very intrigued that I was actually um, became Muslim. Right. Um, and I thought that he was going to be like, oh, you're Muslim. Yeah. Like, oh, why? Why? Why did you do that? Like, I left. Then you come in here. Right. Absolutely. So yeah. of, I gave him a bit of empathy. Excellent. But, I mean, I'm willing here because I believe in empathy. Right, 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 right. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, um, uh, for a lot of them, they become atheists because of certain uh, skepticism and misconceptions and doubts. But others, maybe because of, uh, because of calamities, problems, and others still because uh, they don't see any other alternative. So, so one person I saw when I was in the States, 
And he's like, I'm an atheist. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, were you always one? He said, no, I was a Christian. So, when he saw that Christianity is not the right way, the, he didn't see any other alternative. So, okay, if it's not this, then atheism, right? Uh, he didn't uh, find the, the, the truth to be able to go to it before atheism. There was another uh, reply here, giving, giving people hope. Yes, brother? Listen. Okay, so remembering those people before us, remembering the best of humanity who also experienced those difficulties. Yes. There is always someone who is facing more serious trouble. Than Absolutely, people. right? This, uh, even though it's not, um, it's not the, maybe the most direct evidence for it, but in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us, "Wa fawqa kulli dhi ilmin alim." And over every person of knowledge is someone even more knowledgeable. You can extrapolate and say, similarly, if you are having problems, someone else is having even more. And guess what? Every time you say, it cannot get any worse, all of a sudden it will. And this has happened to a relative of mine. And believe me, almost in the instant they said, cannot get any worse, it did. Beware of this. This is a, an example of objection against the qadr and it can be very dangerous. Yes, Sister Hada. Yes. I think uh, to take action, to take some kind of support, some kind of active help. Right, Not absolutely. To talk. Yes, Barakallah Fiqh, very nice. No matter how nice the talk is, the talk is cheap sometimes. When somebody is in despair, absolutely. Absolutely. they want action. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of times we just theorize, okay? We just, uh, you know, we talk the talk, but, you know, we, we don't necessarily walk the walk. We don't uh, give them what they need of, of therapy, of help, of counseling, of aid, of whatever it is. Uh, this happens a lot. And actually, in, in, in that regard, uh, again, another story. When I was in the U.S., a lady, when she heard about the predicament of many Arabs and Muslims, okay, having issues with, uh, you know, civil rights, uh, being discriminated against, and things, things of that nature, uh, it amazed me that in the instant she heard about it, she didn't give lip service in any way. She immediately took action. So I was informing her about the situation of uh, one of the brothers. So she said, we have a meeting today in so-and-so organization. I'm going to bring it up in the meeting today and we'll try to do something about it. So her, her practicality impressed me, you know. Uh, someone else might say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. May Allah help you. That's fine and all, but you know, what are you going to do about it? And she's a non-Muslim, by the way. Right? So being practical, as the sister says. Tayyip, what if the person you're trying to instill hope in does have Iman, but it's kind of shattered? So it gives you the avenue of quoting from the Qur'an, of trying to help them, but through the Qur'an. Where would you go? What would you say? Story of Yunus alayhi salam, excellent. Now you got me into a, a predicament because uh, I, I'd have to explain this a little bit and I didn't want to because it might take a little bit of time but uh, maybe you can remind me at the end. SubhanAllah this happened in the same way in the last workshop and I had to delay it as well. Uh, so the sister is saying Allah will not test you beyond your capacity. It's a very common idea and it's a very good answer. But maybe in the end, I'll try to uh, comment on this. Okay, what else? Give me verses. So basically, at the time of the Prophet at the time of the Tabi'i, they used to, I mean, they were living with the Qur'an, not like you and me, okay? But they were living with the Qur'an on a daily basis. Okay, it was always here and here, all right? 
So they would uh, surmise about which ayah gives you know, those in despair the most hope. Which ayah is the most scary when it comes to those who are sinful or the sinners. Okay? So can you think of an ayah that fills people with hope that you can quote? Okay, excellent. This is in the context of sinners. This is in the context of sinners. Allah Azza wa Jal says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ This, to many, was the ayah that gives the most hope to a sinner. If someone comes to you and says, I have done everything in the book, Every sin you can think of and you cannot think of, I have done. Will Allah ever forgive me? You recite this ayah. Say, Ya Muhammad, O oh my slave servants that have wronged themselves, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. It doesn't get any better than that. No matter what you have done, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا الله سبحانه وتعالى forgives all sins إنه هو الغفور الرحيم وأنيبوا إلى ربكم and turn to your Lord so he doesn't keep it at that because this ayah opens the door of hope wide so a person thinks الله أكبر nobody is ever going to be punished based on this but Soon after, وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَسْلِمُوا لَوْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمُ الْعَذَابِ Turn to Allah before the punishment comes to you. Otherwise, people would have maybe completely dependent on the mercy of Allah, like the murji'ah that we mentioned in the beginning of the talk. Okay? In fact, in an authentic hadith that subhanAllah I used to know many years ago and it just came to my mind now. The Prophet ﷺ said, I believe it's in Sahih Muslim that uh, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so extensive that you would think that nobody is going to go to hellfire. And the punishment of Allah is so severe that you would think that no one will go to paradise. This is the balance that we need to keep. See? This is what we're talking about. Being between hope and fear. But, but, these people, the situations we're talking about here, are people who are already on the cliff, almost in complete despair. For these types, they need hope. They don't need fear. They're way off balance. They're way on the right, if we can call it the right. And you need to try to bring them back to the, to the center. So this is in the context of sinning. What about the ayah that infuses us with hope in the context of life's calamities? <laughs> Okay, okay. All you who have believed, seek the aid and the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sabr and salah, in patience and through prayer. Absolutely, this is one of the techniques, right? Be patient. Try to increase your prayers if you can, right? What else? Inna ma'al usri yusra. Definitely. Indeed, with difficulty comes ease. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ Why did he say it twice? Why is it repeated? Ta'keed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is confirming it. Yes. What else? What's that? Barakallah feek. Excellent. MashaAllah, the brother is going to get several prizes today. 
Okay, what's the ayah? So the brother was saying, two units of relief for one unit of hardship. And the Prophet ﷺ said, commenting on this ayah, that one unit of hardship will not overpower two units of ease. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى In other words, definitely after difficulty or hardship comes ease. Excellent. What's the ayah sister? That gives us the meaning that you were talking about now. That's the ayah I'm looking for. Okay, he's a razzaq. But that's specifically about rizq, right? Only. In Allah wa razzaq. Yeah. But that comes after what? After which ayah? That's after. And then ma uridu minhum min rizqin wa ma uridu an yutaimu in Allah wa razzaq. So there, it's, uh, it's, it's talking about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need for any of us. And that's a different... Okay, and there was another hand. Yeah, sister, did you get the ayah? No? Which one? Ah, barakallah feekum. Excellent. وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Allahu Akbar. وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And whoever fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will make a way out for him. Even when that way out for you is completely invisible. Is completely, you know, unseen. You cannot even expect. How is Allah going to get me out of this? I can't even imagine it. And this is why he says afterwards, وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And he will provide for him from where he least expects it. You know, they tell you, you say this ayah, and they say, Shaykh, what do you mean? I told you my situation. Where is it going to come from? My dear, did you hear the ayah? Min haythu la yahtasib. It's going to come from a place you do not expect. So you cannot now say, where is it going to come from? Because you're expecting. Then if, you, if you're able to answer where it might come from, then that's not what the eye is talking about. You're expecting. It's going to come from where you don't expect. Right? Did you ever ponder where this ayah came? Which one? Surah Talaq. What comes to your head? Isn't talaq a calamity? Actually, this ayah coming in this surah is proof of the extent of crisis that talaq really is. And the only ones who can vouch for that are those who have tried it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distance it from all Muslim homes. It's coming in the context of talaq. You might have thought, where would this ayah come? And this ayah for many was, if they were asked what is the ayah that gives a person the most hope in the time of despair, it is this ayah. Whoever is pious and fears Allah, Allah will make a way out for them and grant them from where they least expect it. And whoever depends on Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, suffices them. One, if you thought about it, you might have thought, hmm, where would that come? After what predicament? Talaq. Which maybe some people underestimate. Yes, brother. Sheikh, you said uh, when you were talking for somebody who wasn't really uh, pious that much. Right. So, when it taqillah, taqwa is, I think, uh, That's as true. a range of time. That is true. He will not see himself as, as a muttaqi. Absolutely. So he said, ah, this is even worse. That's it. Okay, I'm not okay. Even that, granted, granted. Hey, so what shall I do? However, I however, it's, it's, uh, when you say, يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ Because that's all he's looking for. Yes, yes. He's telling me, give me a way out. And you tell him, you want a way out? 
work towards taqwa. You're not telling him, be like Sheikh so and so. But you're, you're trying to get them on that track and telling them, Allah is telling you. Because when I tell him there's a way out, I mean, I'm a regular human being. I can try to help you to a way out, but now Allah is telling you there's a way out. And the way out is taqwa. In other words, get on that road. And if they start, who knows? Maybe they'll be able to continue. You know what I mean? But in terms of the... Because this is the only ayah that mentions it in this way. يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَا Right? A way out. And this is what people want. The light at the end of the tunnel. Right? مَخْرَجَا Taqwa is the way. Rectify your, your situation. You're, you're, you're not doing your prayers right. Try to do your prayers right. You are uh, doing, committing this and this and that sin. Stop. Try to repent. Even if it's gradual. But make your way, to way towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Guess what? Then you remind them of the hadith. Whoever comes a little bit closer to Allah, Allah comes much closer to him. Right? Obviously not uh, geographically or physically. But you come towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he comes to you much quicker. You take a small inching or inkling towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will come to you quicker and even more. You, you, you start to talk about these things, Wallahi, you start to melt their hearts. Yes, someone, had, someone else had something. Yes, sister. Or remind, by the way, remind ourselves also. We keep saying remind them as if we are angels walking. <laughs> we remind ourselves and then, yes, sister. Yes, yes, excellent. The names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful, is the most forgiving. What about the hadith? The hadith of the Prophet There is a hadith that says that if you... What? The general meaning of it was... Yes, this is what we were just mentioning now. Exactly. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. If you do not associate any partners with Allah, even if you committed sins, the earth's fill, the fill of the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, can forgive. So in other words, never ever be in despair. We're still on point number two, brother. Give me a minute. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, we, we, we'll take a, a small break. Just let me finish uh, this part. What we can also say is that no matter what you have done in your life, keep trying. No matter how much you've tried, because a lot of these people, or if we are in that situation, God forbid, uh, they want, maybe deep down, they would like to improve. They would like to become better. They want to become closer to Allah. But somehow they're just not able to. And they tell you, well, I can't do it perfectly. It's going to be imperfect. In that situation, imperfection might be acceptable. Meaning, let's say a person is drinking alcohol. And they're not praying. And you tell them, brother, sister, leave this sin. This invites the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Start praying. They tell you, I cannot. I'm addicted. Can I pray only? Or just pray and continue in this kabira that I'm doing this major sin? Maybe someone will say, no, you have to leave it. This is a kabira. In that situation, their drinking of alcohol, their committing of this major sin, is less of a sin than what? Than not praying at all. Prayer is the last frontier, my brothers and sisters. Prayer is the last thing, meaning, it's the last thing the shaitan is able to eliminate in your life, after which he owns you. Before that, 
he probably doesn't own you. But if he gets to prayer, the last fortress, the last wall, he owns you. It's like a, a fortress. Many walls. He breaks into the first, the second, the third. The last one is prayer. If he breaks through that, you're done. You're finished. Prayer is the most important duty that a Muslim can perform. Grounds your faith, your back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does anyone disagree with this statement? Prayer is the most important duty. Anyone disagree? It's one of the pillars of Islam. Is there a pillar that's more important? I said the most important duty for a Muslim. He's already done the shahada. No, I didn't say for a human being. The most important duty for a human being is shahada, yes, to enter into Islam. But the most important duty for a Muslim, he's already a Muslim, is prayer. Okay. They are addicted to this or that, God forbid. They need to start praying. Otherwise, they'll never make it towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the sister said, maybe in one of the sujoods, something happens, something miraculous happens. They're touched. The layers upon layers, you know, over their hearts start to dissolve, are lifted. They need that connection. Without that connection, they can never make it towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first place. So in that situation, yes, do whatever you're doing, but start praying. You must pray. This is the main thing that distinguishes between a believer and a disbeliever. This is the main thing that can possibly protect them from the shaitan. Otherwise, it's going to be most difficult. So yes. Now you say, but what about in salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar? Prayer should prohibit one from these immoralities, right? And sins. Yes. That's the perfect and most complete prayer. They're not there yet. They're not even praying for God's sake. Beware of these zeros and ones. The mutually exclusive uh, conundrum. It's always like that. Either this or that. Right? I remember long back, you know, a brother would say something like, I'm not going to go to Hajj until I am pure. <laughs> That's the whole idea, right? But they don't want to go until Hajj to Hajj until they are perfect. So guess what? They will die and they will not go to Hajj. Because they'll never reach that level of perfection. Okay? Another brother, brother, you should pray. Yes, I want to pray. Okay? But not yet. Why? Because I cannot pray five. Okay. Why not? No, I, I can't. So I'm not going to pray at all. I said, no, pray two or three. Just start. Do something. No, it's either this or that. This mutually exclusive misconception. It's always like this. Either everything or nothing. No, that's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. I, I'm going to have to stop here and we will continue, inshallah. Uh, we'll take a small... Five, ten minute break.